So the disadvantage, the primary disadvantage to this topology is that the network is dependent on every node for success. If any of those items are not working properly, the entire topology is non-active. The next type of topology we'll look at is a mesh topology. Due to cabling costs, physical mesh topology can be very expensive to implement depending upon the number of nodes to be interconnected. Its primary advantage is that it's decentralized and so it doesn't depend on a single node for network success. As an FYI, full mesh topology is most commonly seen in military applications because it really needs high degrees of reliability. More common is a partially connected mesh topology when some of the modes of the network are connected to more than one other node with a point-to-point -point link. It makes it possible to take advantage of some of the redundancy that's provided with a full connected mesh without the expense and without the complexity required to connect every single node in the network to every other item in the network. A virtual private network, it's a secure way of connecting to a private local area network at a remote location. You'd be using the internet or any insecure public network to transport network data packets privately, but you'd be using encryption. VPNs are frequently used by remote workers or companies with remote offices to share private data and network resources. So for example, if I were wanting to communicate specifically with the Burley Center, I might take advantage of a virtual private network connection so that the information that I send to them is more secure than if I sent it directly using the internet. This diagram demonstrates three topology examples that you might use when setting up a network. And just as an FYI again, home networks would likely substitute a hub router for the file server shown in the examples. This home networking example uses two topology formats. The primary format is a star with all computers connecting through the hub. The printer is available to all computers, but its connection is set as a point-to-point -point through the office computer. I find setting up a topology in this format for home is especially helpful when children are using computers. That way you don't end up with 500 copies with one letter per page. As a review, the internet is an open public space, but an intranet is designed to be a private space. It's still virtual, but it's protected. An intranet may or may not be accessible from the internet, but it is, as a rule, protected by password and accessible only to employees or other authorized users. Now, an extranet is a portion of an organization's intranet that's made accessible to authorized outsider users, but they're not given access to the entire intranet. Maybe they're a part-time or temporary employee and they need access to be able to submit their work hours. So they're given that accessibility within the company's database system, but they don't have access to the entire database system. A firewall is simply a program or hardware device that filters information coming through the internet and, and it's coming into your private network or your computer system and it stops packets of information um, that it reads as not being permitted to pass through. And you'd customize your firewall. Um, there's several options. Um, IP addresses, domain names, protocols, those are just a few of the options. We touched briefly on the connectivity, so let's uh, stop back on analog. And that is that modem or the dial-up access. It's economical, but it's also very slow. So using a modem connected to your PC, you'd connect to your internet service provider by dialing a phone number that they would provide. Dial-up is analog because the data is sent over a public telephone network. DSL is also called an always-on connection. It uses copper telephone line to connect to 
your home or office so it doesn't tie up your telephone line like a dial-up connection does. Cable, through the use of a cable modem, you'd have a broadband internet connection and it's designed to operate over cable TV lines. Cable internet works by using a TV channel space for data transmission. It uses certain channels to downstream and other channels to upstream information. So because it has that dual use and provides greater bandwidth, a cable modem can extreme or can achieve extreme fast access. Next on our list is wireless internet connection. We spoke briefly about that before. Wireless is also called Wi-Fi, wireless fidelity. So instead of using your table, excuse me, instead of using telephone or cable networks for your internet connection, you'd use radio frequency bands. Wireless internet provides an always-on connection like DSL and cable, and it's available anywhere as, as long as you are geographically within the network coverage area. One of the problems that you can have with wireless, well a couple of problems, the first is that it can be affected by um, elements within a building. If you have um, a lot of metal in a building or space or other connection, it, you, you can have connection issues depending upon um, how a structure is built, how far you are from the the main point of coverage, etc. Another challenge with wireless internet is security. Um, it is an easier access, easier to break into and to steal information. Uh, satellite, um, internet over satellite, so it's also called IOS. It, it allows a user to access the internet via satellite that orbits the Earth. So because the satellite is at a static point above the Earth and it's fixed, um, and because of the enormous distance, it, it can be a little bit slower to get information. But for some users that don't have other options, it's a way for them to be able to get connectivity, although it can be a bit expensive. Something that businesses and internet service users or internet service providers use is called T1 and T3 and basically T lines, and they're leased or purchased options for businesses, and they um, and it's for connecting to the internet, um, and it's also for connecting to the internet backbone if they're an internet service provider. What it actually consists of is 24 separate channels that are individually they can be configured to carry voice or data traffic and they're very very high speed. We've already touched on the first four connectivity types listed here so let's skip to infrared. Infrared technology well it allows computing devices to communicate via short-range wireless signals. So with infrared computers can transfer files and other digital data bidirectionally. The, now infrared communication spans only very short distances, um, no more than say just a few feet, um, three to five feet pretty much, you might be able to get a little bit longer. Unlike Wi-Fi, um, infrared signals can't penetrate walls or other obstructions and they only work in line of sight so there's some limitations to it. And the last is Bluetooth. And it's a low power radio communication and it wirelessly links phones and computers and other network devices once again over short distances. Um, a little weird side note, um, the name Bluetooth it was borrowed from Harold Bluetooth, a king in Denmark a thousand years or so ago. Bizarre. Not quite sure how it ties in, but next time you're on Jeopardy, you'll know. Um, anyway, Bluetooth was designed primarily to support simple wireless networking of a personal consumer device and the peripherals like cell phones, PDAs, wireless headsets, etc. You can 
it's it's longer it's it's a wider range than infrared um of about it, you can go up oh about 30 feet but that would be about as far as you'd want to be away from your device so that's a quick overview of networking and the pieces and components that go into networking thank you very much <laughs>